without his consent and without compensation, or by force or by fraud, to anyone who does not own it, then I say that property is violated, that an act of plunder is committed. How is this legal plunder to be identified? Quite simply, see if the law takes from one person what belongs to them and gives it to other persons to whom it does not belong. See if the law benefits one citizen at the expense of another by doing what the citizen himself cannot do without committing a crime. As history has proven, each class or special interest group competes with the others to throw the lever of governmental power in their favor, or at least to immunize itself against the effects of a previous thrust. Labor gets a minimum wage, so agriculture seeks a price support. Consumers demand price controls, and industry gets protective tariffs. In the end, no one is much further ahead and everyone suffers the burdens of a gigantic bureaucracy and a loss of personal freedom. <laughs> With each group out to get its share of the spoils, such governments historically have mushroomed into total welfare states. We're well on the way. Once the process begins, once the principle of the protective function of government gives way to the aggressive or redistributive function, then forces are set in motion that drive the nation toward totalitarianism. It is impossible to introduce into society a greater evil than this, the conversion of the law into an instrument of wonder. Students of history know that no government in the history of mankind has ever created any wealth. People who work create wealth. James R. Evans, in his inspiring book, The Glorious Quest, gives this simple illustration of legalized plunder. Assume, for example, that we were all farmers and that we received a letter from the government telling us that we were going to get $1,000 this year for plowed up acreage. But rather than the normal method of collection, we were to take this letter and collect $69.71 from Bill Brown at such and such an address, $82.47 from Henry Jones, $59.80 from Bill Smith, and so on down the line, that these men would make up our farm subsidy nor would 99% of the farmers walk up and ring a do man's doorbell, hold out a hand and say, give me what you've earned, even though I have not. We simply would not do it because we would be facing directly the violation of a moral law. Thou shalt not steal. In short, we would be accountable for our actions. The free creative energy of this choice nation created more than 50% of all the world's products and possessions in the short span of 160 years. The only imperfection in the system is the imperfection in man himself. The last paragraph in this remarkable Evans book, which I commend to all, reads, no historian of the future will ever be able to prove that the ideas of individual liberty practiced in the United States of America were a failure. He may be able to prove that we were not yet worthy of them. The choice is ours. According to Marcus' doctrine, a human being is primarily an economic creature. In other words, his material well-being is all important. His privacy and his freedom are strictly secondary. The Soviet Constitution reflects this philosophy in its emphasis on security. Food, clothing, housing, medical care, the same things that might be considered in a jail. The basic concept is 
that the government has full responsibility for the welfare of the people, and in order to discharge that responsibility must assume control of all their activities. It is significant that in actuality the Russian people have few of the rights supposedly guaranteed to them in their constitution, while the American people have them in great abundance, even though they are not guaranteed. The reason, of course, is that material gain and economic security simply cannot be guaranteed by any government. Material gain and economic security are the result and reward of hard work and industrious production. Unless the people bake one loaf of bread for each citizen, the government cannot guarantee that each will have one loaf to eat. Constitutions can be written, laws can be passed, and imperial decrees can be issued. But unless the bread is produced, it can never be distributed. Why then do Americans bake more bread, manufacture more shoes, and assemble more TV sets than the Russians? They do so precisely because our government does not guarantee these things. If it did, there would be so many accompanying taxes, controls, regulations, and political manipulations that the productive genius that is America's would soon be reduced to the floundering level of waste and inefficiency now found behind the Iron Curtain. As Henry D. Thoreau explained, this government never of itself furthered any enterprise, but by the alacrity with which it got out of the way. It does not keep the country free. It does not settle the West. It does not educate. The character inherent in the American people has done all that has been accomplished. And it would have done somewhat more if the government had not sometimes in its way. For government is an expedient by which men would fain succeed in letting one another alone. And as has been said, when it is most expedient, the governed are most let alone by it. Now with all these blessings, what more is necessary to make us happy, a happy and a prosperous people? Still one thing more, fellow citizens, said Thomas Jefferson. A wise and frugal government, which shall restrain men from injuring one another, which shall leave them otherwise free to regulate their own pursuits of industry and improvement, and shall not take from the mouth of labor the bread it has earned. The principle behind this American philosophy can be reduced to a rather simple formula. Economic security for all is impossible without widespread abundance. Two, abundance is impossible without industrious and efficient production. And three, such production is impossible without energetic, willing, and eager labor. And fourth, this is not possible without incentive. And five, of all forms of incentive, the freedom to attain a reward for one's labors is the most sustaining for most people. Sometimes called the profit motive, it is simply the right to plan and to earn and to enjoy the fruits of your labor. Sixth, this profit motive diminishes as government controls, regulations, and taxes increase to deny the fruits of success to those who produce it. Seven, therefore any attempt through governmental intervention to redistribute the material rewards of labor can only in the eventual destruction of the productive base of society, without which real abundance and security for more than the ruling elite is quite impossible. Now we have before us currently a sad example 
of what happens to a nation which ig ignores these eternal basic principles. Former FBI agent Dan Smoot succinctly pointed this out on his broadcast number 649, dated January 29, 1968, as follows. England was killed by an idea. The idea that the weak, indolent, and profligate must be supported by the strong, industrious, and frugal to the degree that tax consumers will have a living standard comparable to that of taxpayers. The idea that government exists for the purpose of plundering those who work to give the product of their labor to those who do not work. The economic and social cannibalism produced by this communist socialist idea will destroy any society which adopts it and clings to it as a basic principle. Any society. Nearly 200 years ago, Adam Smith, an Englishman, who understood these principles very well, published his great book, The Wealth of Nations, which contains this statement. The natural effort of every individual to better his own condition, when suffered to exert itself with freedom and security, is so powerful a principle that it is alone and without any assistance not only capable of carrying on the society to wealth and prosperity, but of surmounting a hundred impertinent obstructions with which the folly of human laws too often encumbers its opponents. Though the effect of these obstructions is always more or less either to encroach upon its freedom or to diminish its security. This should be required reading for every Britisher. On the surface, on the surface of this, on the surface, this may sound heartless and insensitive to the needs of those less fortunate individuals who are found in any society, no matter how affluent. What about the lame, the sick, and the destitute? Is an often voiced question. Most other countries in the world have attempted to use the power of government to meet this need. Yet in every case, the improvement has been marginal at best and has resulted in the long run creating more misery, more poverty, and certainly less freedom than when government first stepped in. As Henry Grady Weaver wrote in his excellent book, The Spring of Human Progress, most of the major ills of the world have been caused by well-meaning people who ignored the principle of individual freedom except as applied to themselves, and who are obsessed with a fanatical zeal to improve the lot of mankind in the mass through some pet formula of their own. The harm done by ordinary criminals, murderers, gangsters, and thieves is negligible in comparison with the agony inflicted upon human beings by the professional do-gooders who attempt to set themselves up as gods on earth and who would ruthlessly I say the harm done by ordinary criminals, murderers, gangsters, and thieves is negligible in comparison with the agony inflicted upon human beings by the professional do-gooders who attempt to set themselves up as gods and who would ruthlessly force their views on all others with the abiding assurance that the end justifies the means. <laughs> By comparison, America traditionally has followed Jefferson's advice of relying on individual action and charity. The result is that the United States has fewer cases of genuine hardship per capita than any other country in the entire world or throughout all history. Even during the depression of the 1930s, Americans ate and lived better than most people in other countries do today. In reply to the argument that just a little bit of socialism is good so long as it doesn't go too far, it is tempting to say 
in like fashion.